I have started the recording. Perfect. Right. Good morning. My name is Jo, as, as James has just, um, has just mentioned. So I'm going to be leading the uh, presentation this morning and taking you through um, the uh, COVID and beyond. So what, what COVID and beyond is, the subtitle, a step-by-step -step guide to protecting you in your business during a recession is what I'm going to be talking about today. And that's me when I haven't cycled into work um, and got helmet hair. Um, so who am I? So first of all, I'm a qualified accountant and have been for a long time, over 25 years. Um, I worked for 20 years in industry, mostly manufacturing, mostly food, mostly chocolate. Um, I did, like everyone, uh, go to the things that I enjoy and I like chocolate and you tend to get the odd, the odd free bit of chocolate when you're working in one of these organisations. So that worked, worked well for me. Um, while I was in those organisations, I was primarily a commercial management accountant, which means I looked at numbers and produced summaries of those numbers, did analytics on those numbers and created reports so that the businesses could make decisions, commercial decisions on the way that they were going to move forward, look at project evaluation, um, budgets, general management accounts, all that kind of thing. So lots of analytics of numbers um, over 20 years in industry. I was then made redundant for the third time and decided I'd start out on my own. So I've been running my own business for around 12 years. I have an accounting practice on the outskirts of Leeds in a, in a place called Garforth. Um, which is not a million miles away from the Humber region. I have actually, in fact, that you, you'll notice on there, uh, oh, maybe, no, I've not, maybe I've not got it on there, but I actually worked for Birdseye. Yes, it is on the slide, sorry. Um, I worked for Birdseye up and, up and over at closing. It wasn't my fault, I'd just like to say that. Um, but I have, in fact, worked out in that area um, for a few years, but a few years ago. So, yeah, so I, I started the accounting practice, got a team of 10, um, we've got a couple of hundred clients and we support those in all of the things that you'd expect an accountant to support them in, plus lots of value added activity because of my management accounting background. So I'm going to use some of that um, today uh, in the agenda that we've got to look forward to. So the first thing that I'd like to talk about is the fact that we have got lots of moving parts at the moment. And if you're anything like me, you won't like the fact that there are lots of things that are outside your control. We always have things that are outside our control in our lives and we need to not focus on those things, manage them perhaps, manage the effect that they have on us and on our businesses, um, but look at the things that we can control. But at the moment, that's just gone mad. So the things that we can't control are huge and have a massive impact on us, our lives and our businesses. And how do we protect our business so that once all of those non-control elements get more controlled, um, we can come out of this fighting. We can come out of this current issue that lots of people are facing and grow because we've put the right controls in place to grow from. They create a great platform for growth. So that's what I'm going to be talking about today. So the overrider is um, cash is king. Now, I'm not the first person to say that. I'm not, I'm not going to claim that as my own phrase. Cash is king, queen, all of the courtiers. It's everything in business. If you don't have cash, the chances are you won't have a business. So I'm going to be talking about how you protect your cash, cash position in, in a recession situation like we're in right now. And also protect your reputation. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And fundamentally, I like to think you protect your reputation by doing what you say you'll do. Um, and that is a way that I live my life, is that if I say I'm going to do something, then I do it. Um, and then people know that they can trust me. And that, that goes for everyone, and it does make life much simpler if everybody does that. Make mindful decisions. So whilst we're saying that we're protecting our reputation by doing what we say we'll do, we can't just assume that everybody else is going to do that. So what we would like to think that everyone has a similar belief structure as we have, and a morality structure as we have. Unfortunately, 
they don't have. And whilst I don't want to say to you, don't trust anybody, equally I'm going to say to you, make mindful decisions and make sure you protect yourself, especially from people who you don't know. Um, and understand your numbers. I'm not going to go into a lot of depth about this, but understanding your numbers is a, such an important thing when you're running a business. You need to understand your cash flow. You need to know what cash you've got coming in and what cash you've got going out and whether you need to employ one of these um, Sybils or bounce back loans or something to bring cash in in the short term to allow you to leverage growth or even just survive. If you don't know what your cash forecast looks like, how would you know? How would you know whether you needed any more money to come into the business, whether what you've got is going to last you until more money comes in? So understanding your cash flow is really, really important. And I believe that there are other sessions that are focusing just on that, that James will talk about later. Um, and also understanding where you make money. It's really important to know which elements of your business, if you're time stretched, which elements of your business makes money, which elements of your business don't, because there is really no point being a busy fool in any environment, but particularly not during a recession. So we'll start off by talking about suppliers. So we all have suppliers of goods and services. Oh, sorry, I think I've just change something there, sorry. Um, so we all have suppliers of goods and services, and we all had suppliers before all of this uncertainty happened and the recession started. But those people who were providing goods and services to us prior to this, can they still do it? You might have a supplier who you've had for years who now is working from home. And all bets are off because they can't do the same role from home. Now, lots of people can and have set up home office working solutions that, that are seamless. But for some people, it's not seamless. And maybe some of your suppliers are struggling. Maybe they're not able to supply the same level of service as they supplied before. What impact is that going to have on you? Can you talk to those suppliers, whether it's goods or services, if you've got an ongoing supply relationship with them about no longer getting their supply in the short term because you don't need it. Maybe it's things like you're working from home and you no longer need milk delivering or your bins emptying or whatever. Cut down the costs as much as you possibly can and make sure that your suppliers are not going to let you down. Remember that first slide with the reputation. Can your suppliers still provide you the same supply chain as they were supplying before? It might be that they can't get hold of the things that they were supplying to you um, or make the things that they were making for you or whatever. But you need to look at all of your suppliers and make sure that they're able to do what they said they would do. You also need to look at whether or not you've got any guarantees or penalties for not supplying your goods that you have previously ordered. So sometimes you'll have... Um, a contract in place that will say if you don't get X amount of goods by Y date, then there'll be a guarantee or a penalty that you can put in. You might have IT support that has a service level agreement or they'll get you back up and running within two hours. Can they still do that? What have you got built in? Now, you might not be able to get those built into contracts now, but if you had suppliers previously and you had got those built in, then you may need to call upon those clauses in your contracts that you've set up with your suppliers. So credit check. Have you ever credit checked any of your suppliers? Now, lots of people don't think this is a requirement, but really in a time of recession, when there are people doom and gloom, saying that 30% of small businesses are likely to go under in the next six to nine months. Now, if that's true, and I'm really hoping that it's not, because those small businesses have got families and they've put things on the line for those small businesses. I really hope that that isn't a stat that's going to hold true. But what happens if it is? What happens if one of those businesses that goes under is your key supplier? And that means that you now are going to let down your customers. How's that going to feel? 
So have a look at the credit check-in software that's available. There are some that you can get credit checks on businesses for free. Some of them you have to pay for. And, you know, have, have a look at what that would be. Because if the impact of your supplier on you is going to have a reputational impact on your customers, then maybe you should be doing a credit check on them and making sure that they don't go under. And especially if they're asking for upfront payments. So if you give an upfront payment to a supplier who then goes bust and goes into liquidation, the chances of you getting more than a few pence in the pound back for that money that you've put in are slim, especially now that HMRC have changed the rules and now they are priority and at the top of the list when somebody goes into liquidation, you're not going to get a great deal of that money back. So some people in this environment, and quite rightly, are asking for upfront payments because cash is king for them too. So if they're asking for an upfront payment for you and you're able to provide that money, lovely, but make sure that it's safe. Please do not give upfront payments to anyone that you have not done a credit check on to make sure that they are not in financial difficulties mm. or as sure as you can be, because obviously there's a, there's a chain of reaction effect that comes down the line sometimes. Um, but just hedge your bets as best you can and don't give up from payments to people who look like they could be in financial difficulties. Some suppliers during this um, environment, this economic environment, are asking for tighter terms. So you might have had terms that were 60 days, 90 days, which, which dovetailed in, in a really lovely way that you were getting paid by your customers before you had to pay your suppliers. That's fantastic if you can manage that. But some people in this environment have tightened their terms because cash has become so important to them, they can no longer give you the 60 or 90 days terms. So watch for that, um, negotiate where you can, negotiate better terms if you can. So if you've got great buying power, great negotiation skills, then you might be able to actually negotiate better days of terms with your suppliers. So you may, may have been on upfront payments and maybe you can get yourself some credit and get in there for 30 days. You don't know if you don't ask. It's always worth asking the question, see what the answer is. You, you might be surprised. You might be surprised. Have your suppliers put their prices up? So we are in an environment where some um, items have become really difficult to source. And supply and demand, um, one of the things that I did a long, long time ago was um, a degree. And it was in economics as well as accountancy. And we looked at supply and demand in that in, in quite a lot of depth. And it's, it's natural that the cost of things go up when supply is restricted. Um, and has that had an effect on you? And is it because it's been restricted or is it just because they're trying to make extra money out of you because they know that you need their services? So watch for that as well. Um, it's, it's about reputation for them as well. So make sure that they don't end up trying to get extra money out of you. So uh, the next thing is new customers. <clears throat> so if you take on a new customer, then credit check them. We're back to the credit check. You've got to credit check every single customer because when you do work for somebody, you're expecting to get paid. That is unless all the people who are on this webinar are working for charities, are in a charitable sector. And even then you're looking for a donation often. But in the business world, if you're a commercial entity, you provide goods or services for a fee, for a fee and a profit. That's what we're doing it for. So you need to make sure that people can afford it. Just because they say they can afford it doesn't mean they necessarily can. So credit check them. Make sure that you're not going to spend a lot of time and money later chasing down that debt um, because it really is very time consuming and negative. You don't want all that negativity in your life going back to somebody and chasing them and hassling them and then getting a debt collector involved. And yeah, it's, it's a lot of negativity that you don't need. You want to be spending all your time on people who are right for you who are going to pay the bills and are right to grow your business, not on people who are after getting your goods or services for free or, or aren't able to pay. So credit check them, have a look, see whether you can get a credit checking service. 
um, and do a credit check before you start. And then consider upfront payments. So if these are new customers, there's a good chance you don't know them. You don't know their reputation, you don't know how quickly they pay, you don't know anything about them. There may have been a referral, in which case you might know through somebody else a bit of something about them. But for new people, it is a great thing to do to get an upfront payment from them until you get to know them, until you get to know what kind of a person they are. Now, a lot of people say to me with this, oh, you know, in my industry, you, you can't get upfront payments. That's, that's not what you can get. You'd be surprised. If people really want your goods or services, if you've really done a good marketing piece so that people are going, yeah, that's what we want, you or your goods or your services, then they will pay an upfront payment. Maybe not in full, but sometimes in full. Um, and sometimes they're more than happy to pay a deposit, maybe 50% of it up front is 50% on completion. And I got told this when I started my accounting practice, you can only charge people for accounting work once you've done it. That's what the industry does. That's all you can do. It's not true. I do charge new customers 100% up front if their year end has already gone past and 50% upfront for other circumstances and then direct debit monthly for everything else. So you can, you can do it, you just have to manage it, build the expectations, set the anchors and ask for it. If people really want to work with you, they will pay it. They will pay whatever it is. So look for um, if, if people want you know payment terms. So lots of people will use 30 days as standard payment terms. Well, maybe your payment terms are not. Maybe yours are 15, maybe yours are seven. You want that cash in and the sooner you get it, the better. Make it really easy for people to pay you and get it as soon as you possibly can. So is it worth it? So you've got customers, there are, people are still changing suppliers, they're still out there buying goods and services, not necessarily in the same magnitude as they were prior to this recession, but there are new customers out there. We've signed up several new customers already during this recession, but you have to ask the question, is that potential new customer right for me? Are they right for me? You don't want to end up being a busy fool. You don't want to work for somebody who's in it just for the price and they're going to constantly be wanting to renegotiate. You want somebody that is the right customer for you right now and for the future. And it might not be the same for both. So you might be going right now, I'll take a lower margin or I'll take somebody who doesn't feel a hundred percent right, but I know that I'm going to get paid. But in the future, they're not going to be right for me. But I think you need to ask yourself that question. Who is this customer, this client? Do I actually want them? Is it somebody who I want to spend time speaking to now and in the future? Because if you're not a good match, you're not a good match. Don't try and force it. The right customers will come if you market your business in the right way. And the wrong customers will give you nothing but grief. You will never make them happy and they will never make you happy. So what is the point? It's a poor relationship. Don't go down that route. So for every potential customer, don't end up being a busy fool. Don't end up just doing a smash and grab and taking anything that you can get because it can end up costing you more than it gives you in the long run. So just, I'm not saying don't take on new customers. I'm saying make sure that it's worth it. Make sure that they are the right customers for you. So what about your current customers? So you've got current customers that have been with you for a while. Things have changed, we're in a recession. So credit check them, credit check them again. I know I'm going on and on about this credit checking and honestly, I get no commission from Experian or Credit Safe or any of the credit checking providers. Um, but yeah, check them again. So if those people are on terms, then <clears throat> make sure they can afford to pay. Make sure that when you raise your invoice, they can afford to pay that invoice. Things may have changed. 
So the other thing that you can do is we, we credit check <clears throat> new customers, but then we set up credit check alerts with our credit check provider. So if anything does change on the credit rating or the lack of information sent to company's house or whatever it might be on that particular um, business, we get a credit check alert that tells us that something's changed. So you don't necessarily then have to think, oh, it's been three months, I need to credit check them again. You set it up, you do the credit check, set up to give you the credit check alerts, and then you'll be told if there's anything that you need, need to know. So the next thing is uh, credit control. So you may have been in a position prior to this, um, this pandemic that you were all right for cash and you could give people 30 day terms, but you know that Billy Bloggs and whoever else, they only ever pay on 60, but you've got a good working relationship with them. And then that, so that'll be okay. Um, maybe now it's not okay. Maybe now you've not got enough cash coming in to be a bank for those customers, because that's what you are. If somebody stretches your credit terms, they're getting finance from you for free. Is that what you want to do? Is that who you are? So you need to collect that money in. How do you collect it in? So a great credit control cycle, I found over many, many years of, uh, of helping people with this kind of thing, is that if, you, if before you raise the invoice, you can get somebody to agree to the price, that is a great thing to do. So <clears throat> an upfront in writing proposal of this is what we're going to do. This is how much we're going to charge you for it. And this is when we want you to pay for it is a great thing or an estimate. And there's loads of estimating software out there now that you can get um, an estimate. You can do it on your phone or your iPad. Um, if you're a, a tradesperson and you're out at somebody's house, you can get them to sign on the screen of your iPhone or, or whatever device you're using um, so that they've agreed to how much you're going to charge them. That's the first thing, because you don't want people disputing how much you charge them later. Um, so that's the first thing. Get them to agree to the price up front. The next thing is you do the work and you do what you say you were going to do when you said you were going to do it. Brilliant. And then you raise the invoice. You raise the invoice and you send it to them. And then a couple of days later, or if you're using Royal Snail Mail, maybe a few days later, you then phone up and check that they've received it. And while you're checking that they've received it, you also check that they're happy with it. So they've received it and there is nothing in there that is worrying them in any way. These are big excuses that people use to not pay invoices. So if you can knock them off long before the invoice is even due, then you're much more likely to get your invoice paid and on time. Then you can leave it for a period of time. Let's say you've gone with the 30 day terms. So you've sent the invoice, you've given it a few days, you've checked that they've got it and that everything's okay. A couple of days before the invoice is due, you then phone up and say, just check in that that invoice is on the payment run this week. What's the date that that invoice is gonna be paid and into my bank? And get the name of the person you spoke to. And then if it doesn't appear in your bank on that day, phone them back. They don't like that. So they're unlikely to do it again. So it is all about relationships. And I'm not suggesting that you do anything to spoil a relationship. You know, be nice to people while ever you're in that phase. But if they then don't pay and they don't do what they said they were going to do, and you need that cash in, and then maybe they're a relatively new customer and they're an unknown quantity, Go legal. Warn them first. Tell them, if I don't get payment by the end of this month, I will have no choice but to escalate this to a debt collection agency. And then do it. Because they're not the right client for you if they're not paying. Again, I'll go back to, if you do work or provide goods to somebody and don't get paid, then you're a charity. It was a gift. And if you didn't decide that it was a gift or that you're a charity, that's theft and now you need to go and see somebody who can get what's rightfully yours you did what you said you were going to do you need to get somebody else to do what they said they were going to do so that's what they do get them in there so payment holidays 
Right at the start of this pandemic, the banks announced that they would give people a three month payment holiday on their mortgages. And this set off a snowball reaction of people also asking for three month payment holidays on all sorts of services. And, you know, I'm not going to be able to pay for this for three months. And, you know, even the guy who owns Weatherspoons, he refused to pay his suppliers and everything because he was closing the doors, I'm not saying it's right but people did it and people do it. The question is, should you do it? So your customers might have asked you for a payment holiday or extended terms because of these unprecedented circumstances that we're in. And you could, because of a relationship, offer that if you can afford to do so. But I would strongly recommend that if you do do that, then you get something in writing and signed and you can pick up e-signature uh, software really easily. So you can get something off to them that they can e-sign that's still legally binding that says that this is a payment holiday. You're not letting them off. How long the payment holiday is and how you're going to collect that money in after the payment holiday. So, for example, the mortgage guys, they're saying you've got a payment holiday, you're still accruing interest during that time and your payments will go up for the remainder of the term. But that might not be good enough for you. You might want to collect it in still this year. So if you give a payment holiday for three months, you might then want to collect it in by doubling the payments in the three months that follow that or whatever that is. But agree it up front and get them to sign something to say that that's what they're going to do because you need that money in okay insurance so everybody's got insurance i hope um and that insurance will cover if you've got business premises your business premises you may have had business interruption cover which is brilliant if you're with one of those insurance providers who are actually paying out on that for COVID-19. Um, but for most people, the insurance element that I wanted to cover off today is about working from home. So lots of people are doing things that they didn't declare when they got their insurance. So one of the first things that I did when we went into this situation was to check that my insurance covered my equipment being taken to my team's homes. So what happens to my laptops and my screens and my chairs, et cetera? Is it covered on their house insurance? Is it covered on my business insurance? Am I covered for that equipment? Am I covered if my team start working from home and have an accident in their home that is now kind of also their workplace? So risk assessments on people's working environment, making sure that they've not got trailing cables, that they've got everything that they need, that they've got a chair, that means that it's not going to give them back issues, that they're going to come back with a claim on things like that. What are you covered for? And is your office covered if you're not in it? So lots of people in office environments are just not, you know, they've, they've battened down the hatches, they're not in their offices at all. But most insurance assumes that you're in the office Monday to Friday. So if you got broken into on a Tuesday at three o'clock in the afternoon when you would normally be open, would you be covered? You need to ask your insurer. Um, so make sure that you're covered. You might have assumed that you were, but make sure that you are. Speak to your insurance broker or provider. Um, and if people are working from home, make sure that there is a decent working environment then get them to sign something to say that you've done the risk assessment with them and that it is a safe working environment. Number one, you want them to be safe. And number two, you don't want to click. So the last thing on here is if you've decided to pivot. So what do I mean by that? So lots of people in business are not doing their business in the same way now as they were two months ago. The world has changed on its axis. And for people to survive that, a lot of the businesses have had to pivot. So lots of cafes have started doing delivery services. They weren't allowed to open as a cafe, 
but they can do deliveries. Therefore, that's what they've been doing. And that's what I'm talking about with Pivot. It isn't only relevant to cafes, though. What else are you doing that you didn't do in the same way before? And if you're doing something in a different way, are you covered for it? So, for example, you may have furloughed your whole team, but you are a cafe or a delivery service or you had a shop or whatever, and now you're doing delivery. And you've decided that you're going to drive the delivery van. Are you on the insurance to drive the delivery van? So delivery drivers now furloughed, you're doing it, great way to reduce your overheads. I am not disputing that that is a good thing to do, but are you insured to do that? So if anything happens while you're in that delivery van, are you actually insured? All I'm saying is check, protect yourself and make sure that whatever you've got in place is actually still relevant and valid now in the different circumstances that we are currently working in. So, <clears throat> accounting. Lots of different things happening at the moment in an accounting perspective. And I'm seeing lots of people asking questions on Facebook, in all sorts of group and on LinkedIn and all sorts of different um, mediums. People saying, I've had a bounce back loan. How do I account for that in my accounting software? How do I account for a Sybil's loan? How do I account for furlough grants or the rates grant or self-employed people for the self-employment income support scheme? How do I put that into my bookkeeping software? What do I do with it? Is it taxable? All that kind of thing. And I'm going to just take you through a bit of that in the next few slides. Um, but, so I'm just going to move on to what can you claim? So you may have caught in the news the Ferrari over the fact that our um, MPs were given a £10,000 bonus for working from home. Now, I'm afraid it's not quite as generous as that, our UK tax system that these guys actually preside over. Um, for us, mere mortals and, and not politicians, we get £6 a week. So the working from home allowance to cover the additional costs that you may incur by being in your home rather than in your workplace is six pounds a week. And you can claim that as an expense um, if you're an employee to your business. Um, you don't have to, if you're an employer, by the way, you don't have to agree to that, but it is a tax allowance that is available. And you as, as the owner of the business, if you're working from home, equally you can, you can charge six pounds a week for additional expenses that you've incurred in doing that. You don't have to have any receipts or anything to go with it. It is a flat rate allowance. Um, over and above that, if you incur any costs that are wholly and exclusively for the purposes of the business while you're working from home. So if you've had to have additional equipment for working from home, you might have needed a, a booster for your router, you might have needed additional cabling, chairs, screen, whatever it might be that you've needed to work from home. If that's a business asset and it is used wholly and exclusively for the purpose of that business, then you can claim it. Um, so you need receipts for all of those things. And if you're VAT registered, obviously you'll need them to reclaim the VAT on them too. Mobile phones is slightly different in that the mobile phone doesn't have to be used wholly and exclusively for the purpose of the business. Um, there is a tax allowance um, given for mobile phone usage that says that any employee of a business is allowed to be provided with a mobile phone and there will be no P11D benefit in kind for the whole of the cost of the phone, even if it's used for private use as well as business use. You don't have to provide them to your team, um, but you can. And if you did, the whole of that cost can go through as a business expense, even if it's the only phone they've got and they're using it for private use as well. That isn't the same for VAT. You can only reclaim the VAT on the business element of that. So um, slightly more complicated to speak to your accountant about that. Uh, training and retraining. So during a time like this, it makes people think about what they're going to do if, if business has taken a downturn and they've now got time on their hands, they're going, OK, well, maybe it's a time to upskill. Upskilling, great idea. 
So getting online, doing online courses, brushing up on things that you never had time for before, um, having a look at new apps and software and all that kind of thing, a brilliant way to spend your time if you're not able to work in the same way on your business as you were before. Um, but upskilling a skill that you already have is a tax deductible expense and retraining isn't. So if you were, I don't know, if you ran a coffee shop before and you've had to close the doors and you've decided that really you'd always wanted to be a dog groomer. So, I mean, that obviously can't do that in the current climate. But, you know, if you decided then to be a dog groomer and you'd gone out and qualified yourself as a dog groomer, that wouldn't be a tax deductible expense because it's a totally new skill that you've retrained in a new thing. So if I was to go out and do some training in something to do with accounting, then that's fine. But if I'm going to do something in, I don't know, something else that you're able to do in this environment, then I may not be able to claim that back as a tax deductible expense. So please be wary of that before you start massively pivoting your business and spending a load of money on retraining just check with your accountant that that will be a tax deductible expense. If you're assuming that it is, then check that it is before you spend the money. Um, just a little nod to directors' wages. So I know that a lot of businesses, um, and particularly directors, are feeling very hard done by from the government, and, and rightly so. So directors of businesses typically will take a small wage and dividends, and they create opportunities for many people in their teams often. Their teams can go on furlough and get 80% of their wage, but the director has been pretty much left um, at sea. Uh, so it's, it's really far from ideal. So what you can do is if you're not working at all, you can put yourself on furlough and claim 80% back of the 700 quid or whatever it is that you're putting through your payroll each month. It's hardly going to... Um, change the world but it's, it's something rather than nothing uh, the other thing is you can process through the payroll it, let's imagine you you haven't even got 500 quid to pay yourself at the end of the month or the extra 200 quid to top up your wages to the, the measly 720 quid you were claiming um, you can still process the payroll even if you don't pay yourself the money it can go into your director's loan account now that's not the case if it was furlough you must pay furlough grants over to the employees that you've claimed it for. So if that's you, that must be paid over to you, but it would only be the 80%. But if you were running a payroll and you were still working, but you couldn't afford to pay yourself at the moment because there just isn't any cash in the bank, then if you still continue to process the payroll, you can leave that as a director's loan, owing that money to you so that you can collect it at some point later in the year. Um, some people I have had come to me say stop running my payroll because I can no longer afford to pay myself um, but actually you know so in some circumstances that might be the right thing to do but in most circumstances we would keep processing the payroll and then the director would take that cash that's owed to them at a point in the future when the cash is available. Uh, I could talk about this all day, obviously, because I'm an accountant, but uh, it, isn't, it isn't the fundamental part of the agenda, so I'm going to move on. So there's time for questions at the end. So just quickly, accounting for, um, so I think this is accounting for loans. Sorry, I've got something um, on my screen. Yeah, accounting for loans. So the loan, so if you've had a bounce back loan or a Sybil's loan, they will, the money will come into the bank. That's the first thing you're going to see of it. The money comes into the bank. So what do you do with that money? It's in your bank. You don't know where to put it in your accounting. Well, it needs to go onto the balance sheet because it's a loan and it needs to go as a long-term liability because most of these loans are over five years or whatever. So often you would then create a long-term liability loan account in the name of that loan so that you can keep it separate, manage it, control it and understand how much is owing on it at any point in time. So you would call it bounce back loan or Sybil's loan or whatever. You might include the name of the lender in there, whatever you will then find useful. Once you start, then it just sits there. Um, it's still in your bank, obviously, but that's where you put it in your accounting software and you've gone off and spent that on keeping your business afloat or investing in the things that you need to invest in or whatever it might have been. 
once you start to make the payments, those payments will be partly repayment of the, let's say it was £10,000, repayment of the £10,000 and partly interest due on it. And the part that's the repayment would go to that same account that you've set up for the loan in the balance sheet to start reducing the amount of money owed on that over a period of time. But the interest is an expense to your business, so that needs to go and be added into your profit and loss account as an interest expense. That's the way that one works. Um, so that's for either the bounce back or the Sybil's loans. If you've had a grant, so this might be furlough, it might be the rates one if you've got business premises and qualified for the rates grant. It might be the, um, the self-employed income support scheme grant or any other grant that you have received. And James just talked about um, grants that might be available to you in the Humber region as well at the beginning of this. So grants, the first thing you need to know is grants are taxable income. So um, you're gonna get taxed on it. It's generally there to cover a cost, a grant. So it'll come in as an income and then wash its face with the cost that it was there to give you back the money for. So it goes in, I would suggest that you would create an account called other income and other income generally sits at the bottom of your profit and loss account rather than the top. So it's away from your normal trading income. So you can still see how you're doing and the things that you're selling, um, your goods and your services that you're selling, pop it into other income, it appears further down. So again, speak to your account if you're not sure how to do that. Um, but it will be taxed. So if you don't spend it all during the year, there will be a tax to pay on it. With things like furlough, you have to spend it anyway. So it comes in, it goes back out when you pay your wages. With the rates grant, that's there to cover any costs you might incur on your um, premises overheads and those kinds of things. But they've not stipulated that you must spend it on that. Um, although I have seen people on social media say that they've spent it on doing up their back garden. That's not a great idea because you will be taxed on it in your business. Um, and the same with the SEISS grant. Um, it's not a very natty title for that one, but very long winded. But that one, again, it's just a grant. It needs to go in. It's taxable income. Keep it away from the rest of your sales. And then you know how you do in year on year. Um, there's lots of people again who are not sure how they claim for these things. Um, I can point you in the right direction if you need that, but we won't have time to cover that during this um, during this session. So, how much should you charge? And I'm just going to have to speed up through this bit because we're I want to leave an opportunity for questions at the end. Um, how much should you charge? Should you give things away? So, <laughs> I've seen. And, and I'm, I'm laughing because I think it's quite amusing. People are offering stuff for free during this time. Now, that's lovely. Again, if you're a charity, if you're just a really lovely person and you're giving stuff for free. But if something looks too good to be true, then it generally is. So I've seen um, an accountant not too far away from me who's been putting on posts saying that because they've been furloughed and they've got loads of time on their hands, going, how have you got loads of time on your hands? I've never been as busy. Um, I'm supporting 200 clients, honestly. I, I've never been as busy in my whole life. Um, but he's not. He's not busy. He's got time on his hands and he's bored of sitting in the garden. So he's prepared to do your self-assessment tax return for free. So this is lovely because free, obviously, is a great price. But you've got to question why. I mean, he's either not great at what he does or he wants to sign you up to services after he's given you the free gift um, of the self-assessment tax return at the beginning. There's other people being saying, oh, they'll come and do your garden. You know, there's, there's a fair few different trades and things um, that have been doing that. But just, you know, question that if you're thinking of taking any of those services. But also question whether you should be doing it too. Just because somebody else is doing it doesn't mean you should be doing it. If your business model is not about giving stuff away, it's about selling stuff that's got real value, goods and services with a real value, great things, top of the tree things, then you shouldn't really be giving them away. 
unless you're offering first month free to try and entice somebody in and that's part of your marketing strategy. So just watch the giveaways. It's tempting to do that. You end up being a busy fool and people who are really keen to get something for free are often not keen to pay. So if you're thinking that you're going to tempt them in on the free ticket, then unfortunately you've anchored them at a price of zero and they may not then come back for your goods and services once they have to pay. So just just question that before you do it. Uh, the same thing with discounts. Discounts are a great marketing mechanism and should only be done when you decide to do them. So I've had a few clients who've said to me at the start of this, um, we've not got the same amount of money coming in now. Can we have a discount? No, no, you can't have a discount. We don't do discounts. We will look at the services that you need based on our pricing mechanism. And if that has changed, then you will pay less. But we're not going to give you a discount just because you've asked for it. Just because now you haven't got as much money coming in. Are we doing the services that we said that we would do for you to the same quality standard, to the same amount of time spent on it? To, yeah, yeah, we are. Is that car the same as it was before? Yes, it is. Why would you get a discount on it? Now, people can do it as a marketing strategy. And if you are doing it as a marketing strategy, just check what that strategy is. Because somebody who asks for and gets a discount once will want it again. Again, your price anchor in at a lower price. So are you putting your prices up? Should you be putting your prices up? We're back to that supply and demand. Um, if you can't get hold of as many of the goods that you're selling that you had before, then maybe you should under supply and demand rules but maybe you should think about the longer game and protect your reputation. So should you put your prices up? It depends. Um, new products or services, if you're pivoting and doing something different, then set it up and do something new. One of our clients has got a shop. Um, they can't operate the shop anymore. They're now doing a delivered service. They've put a minimum price on of £25 because it isn't worth their while doing anything else. So I've been working with them to make sure that their pivot pricing structure, the way that they do their business now that they've pivoted the way that they do it, is right so that they don't end up just becoming busy fools. So price anchors, I've talked about this a few times. Um, the best way to price anchor is to offer different levels of service. So go in with the platinum service with all the whistles, all the bells, all the everything. If somebody then says, actually, I can't afford all of that. My budget doesn't come into all of that. Then talk to them about the gold service and the things that they will lose by going down to the gold service. Um, it, you do earn more. You get people to sign up. You might have been going in on a silver service all the time. You will get people buying your gold and platinum service for you if you start with platinum. So just a nod to that. Um, Protect your reputation in everything that you do. If your reputation is for being the best of what you do and everybody's saying you're the best, you're the best, the product's the best, then make sure it's priced as the best because people will only buy something if it sounds right. The balance has to be right. If you come to sell me a pair of shoes with a red sole and tell me that they're 20 quid, I am not going to believe you if you tell me that they're genuine Louboutins. I'm not. You've got to get the balance right. So if your reputation and what something's worth is high, then the price needs to be high too. And you will get more sales if you get your balance right. But you've also got to believe in that price. You've got to believe in your goods and services. And you've got to get people to believe in that too. So what is your USP? Why is your more worth more? If you can persuade people that you've got something that's worth more, they'll pay more. People pay 800 quid for a pair of shoes. You can get shoes for 20 quid from Tesco, but they still do it. Why? Because people believe they are worth more. So when you're looking at your prices, is it worth more? So if it's a delivered service that you've pivoted to, that is worth more than somebody coming to your shop. Therefore, it should be priced at more. So um, that's all I was going to cover today. So has anybody got any questions? 
don't forget you're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Um, really enjoyed that. I've uh, taken a lot away from it, uh, particularly the the information about the uh, the pricing side of it. I think you you're right, you're completely right about the um, you know things being for free at the moment. Um, there's a devaluation in in services and products uh, because people are offering them for free, but what's the, the catch with that long term? You know, mm-hmm. people are expecting it to be free longer term, you know, after it's after tough we get to build that. a business model on a free product. Yeah, I completely agree. I guess um, we'll open it up to the floor, but to get everything going, I th- I, I just got a couple of questions that I wanted to ask. Okay. Um, firstly, you know, there's a lot of information to take away from these webinars um, and we only have, you know, a really small amount of time. I guess for a business owner, what's the one thing, one, one or two takeaways that you would take away from this webinar? Um, I would say that the first takeaway is to be selfish. Think about yourself first. So in an, env- in an ec- economic environment, I'm not talking about, you know, health and well-being and that kind of thing, but in an economic Uh, environment as we have now it's the same all the time but if you don't protect what you have you can't give other people what you give them so you might be providing services and you might have a team of 10 or whatever it might be if you don't protect what you've got then all of those people will lose out so if you've got people who are off on furlough and refusing to come back from furlough because actually they quite like drinking pina coladas in the garden, but actually your business model suggests that you now need people to be working again, you've got to be a bit selfish and say, I've done the risk assessment, the business comes first, and I've got to protect the business right now to make sure that we all are still here after all this happens. So do the credit checks, make sure that you're insured, be, be a bit selfish. I would say is the most important takeaway and don't make short term decisions that are not mindful about the future and how you're going to come out of this. Because if, if you do, you could end up destroying your business model and not having something to to come out of this with. Completely agree with that. You know, if, um, you know, if you, if you are a business and you, you know, you are in a position where you might have to reduce your, your costs, uh, your price, um, you know, do think about the long-term strategy and, you know, with that, because there will be an expectation that that is a new price and that's the new norm for, for your suppliers, uh, within your, uh, your, the people that are purchasing from you. Okie dokie. Um, I'll open it to the floor now. Um, I, I, I think there's, there's two ways that we can do this. Uh, you can raise your hand, uh, using the, the function or you can come off mute and just, and, uh, I'll just, uh, you know, uh, ask the question away, ask a question, uh, ask away. Stunned silence. Yes. <laughs> I think you must have answered everything in that joke. I find that hard to believe. I really do. <laughs> um, well, if there's no questions, um, no further questions, then I think we'll call it a close for today. Um, just to, just to kind of reflect on um, reflect on today. You know, there is there's an abundant amount of support that's out there for business owners uh, through the the Humber Growth Hub and the LEP. You know. Um, you know, Joe, people like Joe and ourselves are always on hand to, to, to help in certain situations like, you know, around the pricing side of things. So if you do have any questions, you will get a follow up email uh, along with the recording and the presentation. And if you do need any additional support, don't be afraid to ask, you know, we, we are here to help. It is a free of charge program for business owners. Um, so, uh, but yes, uh, there is a cost associated in the background, but yes, uh, it is a free of charge program. So, um, you know, it is, it's perfect for, for business owners that, you know, are, are struggling with the cash flow. Um, and so, yeah, don't be, don't be a stranger and, and don't be afraid to, to get in touch. Uh, I've just had a question come in. Is it recorded? Yes, today is recorded and we will forward you the, uh, the, the recording as well. Uh, it will come through a link uh, through a big mail file. Um, and as I say, if you have any questions from him, you know, feel free to get in touch. Okay. 
Well, thank you very much, Joe. Thank you very much for everyone coming along. Uh, I hope you all uh, stay safe and I hope you enjoy the bank holiday weekend that's coming up as well. Thank you. All right then. See you later. Thanks. Bye. Bye.